4.37. Living below in this so sinful world, ah, they are comfort can afford. We are striving alone to face temptation sore. Tell me where could I go but to the Lord? Now tell me. Tell me where, Lord, when I'm sick and all refuge for my soul, when I am needing, yes, to save me. Now tell me where could I go but to the Lord? Nay, was I kind. I love them, everyone. We get along with sweet accord. But when my soul needs manna from above, tell me where could I go but to the Lord? Now tell me where. Tell me where. When I'm seeking a refuge for my soul, when I am needing, yes, to save me in the end, tell me where could I go but to the Lord. Life here is grand with friends I love so dear. Come. For I get from God's own word. Yet when I face the chilling hand of death, tell me where could I go but to the Lord? Now tell me where. God for Jesus Christ. We are certainly good to be um, still here tonight. We are uh, thankful that uh, everyone is here for our uh, five o'clock worship service. We um, want to uh, encourage you to continue to pray one for another. Um, I want you to know that it is uh, it is okay uh, to uh, have a heavy heart. It is okay uh, to express and have grief. It's okay. That's a part of living. Uh, and I want you to know, I know uh, Brother Curl makes it look easy. Uh, he's taught me how to make it look easy, but it ain't easy. And you know it ain't easy because it ain't easy for you, and it hurt just as much for us. And everybody else you might see down front in front of you teaching and preaching, it hurts. So I want you, uh, I want you to know that. I want you to pray, uh, not only for him and Sister Curl and Tasha and the 
kids, uh, but um, uh, let, let's just consider one another. Can we do that? I think the scriptures teach us to consider one another, and uh, I, I just want to say that I, I know it's unfair because I get the microphone and you don't. I understand that, uh, but I just think on behalf of what the Bible would say, we need to consider one another. Uh, with that being said, I want to continue with our lesson from this morning. If you have not been here uh, this morning, looking at John chapter 4, uh, the woman at the well. Uh, we're on our second uh, sermon from John 4. We started off by talking about uh, Jesus and my walls a couple of weeks ago. And then this morning I introduced another topic for you, Jesus and my secrets. Uh, and I know that uh, sometimes uh, when you hear messages um, that the the sermon sometimes is not finished. And then there are also times, Brother Davis, when you preach, you know this as a teacher, where you can't cover everything. Uh, I'll start a message. I'll be up here till midnight if you want me to cover everything. Uh, so there are things that get left out. And I, I, want, to, I, want, to, I want to nail home a point that might have gotten left off this morning, but I want you to show enough to leave here knowing that point. Uh, so I, I really only have the one point, uh, but I want to tie it in to why, why we struggle with and keep secrets. And I want you to understand that there are some things, there are some things, yes, you do not need to tell anybody. Uh, there's some things you don't, but I want you to understand this, that you do not go through experiences by yourself. And they are not necessarily for yourself. I want you to understand that, that, that we go through things and God expects us to be a blessing to somebody else. Uh, and there are some dark places some of us have been, and we could bless somebody else who's been going through that same dark corridor. And I believe as brothers and sisters, we, are, we have been called to come alongside one another and help one another and pray for one another and be there for one another and say some kind words for one another. Because I'm going to be honest with you, there are some experiences that, that you have that you only can relate to another person who's had that same experience. Amen, somebody. Amen. And, and we make it seem as though a walking with God is just as easy as pie. A child, just pray for it. It's going to be all right. Yes, it's going to be all right. But in between your prayer and when God answers it, you go through some stuff. And you need somebody else who can fill in the blanks for you between your request of prayer and when God answers your prayer. Because, see, sometimes it, it works out where those nights get long. Amen. Uh, uh, them days get long because you're waiting on God uh, to, 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 to fix it for you. So I, I want you to understand that. But I want you to, I want you to also understand that, that there are some things, yes, you need to keep to yourself. But then uh, there is nothing that you ought to try to keep from God. And I want to make sure I nail that down tonight because you cannot. And it is a trick and ploy of Satan to keep you from fully receiving the gift of God, the blessings of God, if you're going to walk around acting like God don't know your stuff. Now, you can be in denial, but he ain't in denial. Amen. So I, I want to pick back up now. Uh, those of you who have not been here, I want you to understand that this woman at the well in John chapter 4 is a woman who has a morally messy past. She has a suspect past. And, and we all know the story uh, from Sunday school. Now, here's this woman that has five husbands. And the one, the man that she is with, is not her husband. And, and Jesus comes along, a complete stranger, and tells her about herself. Now, I'm going to show you this next week, Lord, say the same. Uh, this woman uh, recognizes Jesus as a stranger uh, up front, uh, but she's going to leave knowing him as the Savior. And I want you to understand, you better not act like Jesus is a stranger. Intimately. I want you to understand, he was there when you was created. He knows the day you're going to leave this earth. And he knows everything about you. Jesus said, God knows the very hairs that are on your head. And some of that, some of us, our number has changed over the years. Amen. You don't have to grow my hair out every once in a while to show people I can grow hair, you know. Uh, I, I had an old picture of myself on Facebook, and somebody commented, said, man, I, I can't get used to you wearing hair. And I said, every once in a while, I got to show Isaiah that daddy can grow hair, and I grow it out, amen, so he'll know that I'm not bald. Amen. Uh, 
But then when I let it grow too long, it gets too gray, and I might as well cut it on back out so you can't see the gray in it, so I guess I'm vain. Amen. Uh, but but there, this, this woman has some issues, and, and Jesus speaks to her issue because he knows her. Now, the next thing is, not only does he know her, he knows her needs. And, and, and this is where it gets tricky because uh, in the church today, we have people with problems and issues that need tissues. And honestly, we don't know what to do with them. Oh, preacher, what you trying to say? Well, uh, I don't know about y'all, but uh, if, if you are a single young lady looking to get married, I feel sorry for you. You, you, you know why? Because I, I can't produce brothers fast enough. Amen, walls. You're going to have to understand, it's slim pickings, amen? I thought the single sisters was going to say amen. That's all right. You don't want to tell true shame of the devil. Uh, 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 it, it, it's hard, and, and, and there's going to be an epidemic. So, preacher, how can you say stuff like that? Well, if we're not careful, amen, you might lose your interest in men, oh, Lord, and pick up your interest. Somebody going to help me preach this tonight? Somebody going to help me praise that? See, 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 God knows, I mean, and we don't know, as the church, we don't know what to do with that. Man, you came in and said, Brother Moore, I'm having some feelings, and, and I, I don't know what to deal with them. You know, we're we going to be like, oh, Lord, uh, give me a Bible, give me a Bible. Anybody got a Bible? We're going to be running over to the passage talking about homosexual. Oh, you don't want to do that. We, we, we don't know what to do. We, we can throw scripture at it. But I'll be honest with you, just because it's written in the book don't mean we're going to do it. Amen. <laughs> if it was that easy, Lord have mercy. So, so we struggle. And because uh, men and women might not know how to meet your need, that don't mean the Lord don't know. As a matter of fact, it don't mean the Lord can't fix it. You looking for us to fix it. Don't look for us to fix it. You got to look to God to fix it. So we're going to deal with some more of that on next week about her need. But I want to I want to I want to talk to you about why why we spend so much time wearing our makeup and masks and why we keep our secrets secret. And it stems from an emotion we believe that that ultimately becomes disappointment. Now I'm going to say this real slow because there's a difference between disappointing someone and displeasing someone. Y'all got a few minutes for this? I want to show you something really quickly. Has there ever been a time when you felt like you disappointed God? Most of us can say yes. I certainly know I can. We certainly have been disappointed, and I know we have disappointed someone. However, what does disappointment look like to God? Now, if you look in the dictionary, the word disappoint means to fail to meet an expectation. Failing to live up to expectations creates a sense of defeat in the fulfillment of something desired. Y'all looking at me funny. Okay, Jen's birthday coming up next month, right? All right, Brother P, I'm going to be a good husband, right? So uh, here it is. I'm going to plan her birthday weekend. Now, she is expecting, okay, a wonderful night on the town. New edition concert. <laughs> Dinner at the chart house. You know what I'm saying? We 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 gonna go shop and I'm gonna tell her whatever you want. But her birthday comes and I pick up some hot dogs from the store. And we go home and I get her a gift card. Five dollars to her favorite shopping place, and uh, we watch TV all night. All right. Her expectation is here. Her reality is here, and the difference between here and here is called disappointment. Y'all see what I'm talking about? You expect one thing. Something else happens, and the greater the distance between what you want it to happen and what ended up happening is called disappointment. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever been disappointed by somebody? <laughs> All right. Failing to live up to expectations creates a sense of defeat in the fulfillment 
of something designed. In other words, we disappoint people who have certain expectations of us. I'm disappointed if my favorite team fails to win. Rest in peace, Lakers. Or if my child chooses a different career path. Well, those of you with older kids know what I'm talking about. You knew your daughter was smart and head of her class, and she decided she didn't want to go to college. She didn't want to do that. She didn't want to be like you. She wanted to do something different, and you were disappointed because she didn't live up to her potential. Are y'all looking at me funny? Okay. Or if my, oh, I had this up here. If my birthday gifts are not what I expected, huh, Jen? That's right. Your hopes are dashed as you feel let down in disappointment. Well, how does this then translate, if I can get the slide to fix, okay, it's not going to fix. Come on, Rob, can you advance for me? There we go. Is that the next one? Did you shoot out the next one? That's the next one? Okay. He knows better. Okay. So here's my, here's my diagram. Disappointment equals expectation on the top and reality on the bottom. Now, the gap between expectation and reality is called disappointment. Thus, when there is an expectation and it is unreached, then the greater distance is from the reality, the more disappointment is experienced. For many of us, the worst part about being disappointed is the feeling of letting someone else down. If we apply this thinking to our relationship with God, brothers and sisters, it's problematic. If God expects us to behave a certain way and to do certain things, if we fail to accomplish them, then we stand as a disappointment to God. And I'll be honest with you, that can be a very debilitating emotion. Because when you feel like you've let God down, you will not serve him. You will not pray to him. That's the reason why, that's the reason why we have such a hard uh, time with our prayers when we know we're struggling with sin. Can I just tell the truth, shame the devil? You know when you've been on one, you know them days when we really own one. And I'm talking about you just been serving it up. And, and you know you haven't been right. And then let's say you get into a little funk and, and, and now uh, depression starts to set in. You've been having some tragedies, or adversity, or just some hardship, and it's starting to pile up. And, and you know uh, you haven't been right, and then you stop you know, coming to worship like you should, and we ain't seen you in a couple weeks because you're going through some things. It's hard to pray. When you get there, isn't it? Because you feel like you have disappointed God. And when you feel like you have disappointed God, then you've let him down. You have failed to live up to what he wants you to do and what he expects you to do. Therefore, you feel less than. But brothers and sisters, that is not of God. Satan is telling you God don't want to hear your prayer. That's Satan telling you that. How are you going to go to worship when you got sin on your heart? You ain't doing nothing. No prayers bouncing off the ceiling. Don't we say that? That our prayers was bouncing off the ceiling? What, what does that sound like? God telling you, I died for you. I love you. Oh, but don't pray to me when you sin. That's not of God. That mentality is not of God. It's not even scriptural. But we guilt people into that. We killed him. Why? Because, because we have built this facade that you better do this or God don't want you. But I want you to watch this. If you could do this, you wouldn't need God. Now that don't make sense, right? If you could do it, if you could save yourself, you could have saved Jesus a trip. Am I right about it? Pa Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. If, if I say I don't need grace, I've made Christ's death upon the cross null in vain. So we have to be careful with that thinking. And, 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 and where it comes in is when we, we, we begin to paralyze ourselves and our relationship with God because we feel like we have let him all right, well, preacher, what, what then do we do? Well, here is the lie that we hear. You are constantly letting God down with every new day. He has a fresh and full slate of hopes and dreams for your life. And by the end of each day, he's facing the ugly reality that you failed to be all that he hoped you would. Once again, you haven't lived up to God's expectation. That's a lie Satan told you. Well, what's the truth then, Tyson? God has never been disappointed in you. How can you say that, Tyson? He has never been disappointed, not ever once. 
The emotion of disappointment is not something that God can ever feel. Our enemy, the devil, is skilled at painting a picture of God as brokenhearted or worse, some angry deity who has been failed one too many times by us. Uh, But that simply is not true. God has never been and never will be disappointed in you. How do you say that, preacher? Well, can we just can we talk about what the scriptures teach? Because I want you to understand, Brother Tyson ain't making this up. Can we just go to the scripture really quickly? I want to build a case that you need to let your secrets over to God and give them to him and quit acting like he don't know them and go, go on and, and, and say, Lord, uh, this is what I've been struggling with and I need you to help me with it so he can help you with your stuff. I want to show you why you ought to do that. Well, Well, at the very heart of disappointment is the notion that there's an expectation, that there is something expected of you. But the question we got to ask is, who decides where to set those expectations? Now, when it comes to the church, we have expectations. Now, can we just be honest about how faulty our expectations are? In the morning, we expect it to dress up, put our Sunday, go to best come church. But in the evening, we just want you to come back. We don't care what you look like. See how expectations change? Our expectations change. Now, ain't nobody going to say nothing to me crazy. I don't have on no tie. Whoopity do. But that's because it's five o'clock. Now, if you try to pull a stunt like that this morning, expectations different. Right? Okay, so expectation is set by status quo. Right? We get together and say, this is the line we want everybody to jump to. Now jump to it. And when somebody misses the line, they let us down. It's about to get quiet, but I'm telling the truth. That's all right. I know what I'm saying is right. All right. So we set this expectation. And when people fail to meet said expectations, then we get our feelings hurt. All right, Troy, I give you a gift. And, and, and you tell me thank you on the spot. And I say you're welcome. But a week go by and you haven't sent me a card in the mail. See, I, my expectation is that I did something for you. And I want to be properly thanked. Now, he thanked me when I gave it to him. That wasn't good enough. Because my expectation is you're supposed to go home and realize how much I've done for you and be moved to write it in a card. And if you don't do it, now you didn't let me down. Guess what? I ain't going to never do nothing good for you then anymore. Because you don't know how to say thank you. Hmm. Y'all see that? But you know what we've done? We've taken that to the nth degree. Because I felt so bad that somebody do something nice for me and I write them a thank you card and then they write me a thank you card for my thank you card. But then I feel like I got to write them back because they followed up with a second card. So I got to at least show them that I acknowledge the fact that they sent me a second. And now before you know it, we just writing back, back and back, back and forth saying thank you. And she knew I was thankful the first time when she gave it to me. All right, we laugh at that, but that's the truth, though. You know we do that. We know we do that. Amen. Uh, uh, when there's a death in the family, what do we do? We send the church a thank you card. Don't we do that? See? See, so we have this expectation that when, when certain things happen, you have to do this. But the question is, who sets the expectation? Well, when it comes to relationships, we do. We set the expectation. But what happens when it comes to our relationship with God? Who sets the expectation? You don't. But then the question is, what is the expectation? Secondly, if God knows everything, and we preach and teach that God is omniscient, that he's all-knowing, then is it possible to fail to meet his expectation? And this is where it's going to get thick right here. So let's, let's look at the mind of God in Scripture. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 13. I just want to read and then we're going to make some synopsis uh, and look at a couple of things about it and then I'm going to take my seat. Isaiah 40 and verse 13. The Bible says, who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Or who, as his counselor, has taught him? With whom did God take counsel? And who instructed him? Who taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge? And who showed him the way of understanding? You know those are called rhetorical questions. Because the answer is nobody to all those questions. But Isaiah kept writing those questions. Why? Because he wants you to get you to see that ain't nobody told God what to do. Nobody told God what was fair. Nobody tells God how to do things. Nobody tells God what is right. God is the one who sets the understanding. You don't. Amen. That's that's the reason why we got to stop telling God that ain't fair. 
Don't tell God that ain't fair. He knows what's fair. Amen, somebody. We struggle when bad things happen in our life, when adversity hits. But God knows. He knows more than you and I could ever know. Why? Why? Job said it best in Job chapter 38 and verse number 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? In other words, what you doing questioning me? Why would you say that, God? Why would you say, uh, Job then lost his kids. Job then lost his health. Job then lost his wife. Job then lost his property. He's angry at you. And God said, how do you tell me what to do? Now prepare yourself like a man. And God says, I got some questions I want you to answer for me. So God says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined the measurements of the land? Surely you know, Job, who stretched the line upon it. To what were its foundations fastened? Who laid its cornerstone? Where were you when I made water wet? That's what God wants to know. Where were you when I told the sea to stop and the sand to start? Where were you? When I told the moon where to hide in the daytime and told the sun when to come up, where were you? So the first thing you got to ask yourself is if God knows all that and God did all that, then don't you think he knows all that about you? And the question is, don't you think he knows what you would do and why you made that bad decision and why it ended up the way it ended up? Amen, Walls. Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, in verse number 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth a bud, and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, and it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper the thing for which I sent it. Now this is where it gets tough, brothers and sisters. You know why? Because the things that happen that you're not going to understand why it happened to you. The things you go through, you're not going to understand why you go through. But you better believe God knows why you go through. And no matter how bad it is or how messed up it is, God can use it for his glory. You know why? Because God is a God who's in total control. So brother, brother Moore, I look at CNN, I look at the news, and, and it looks like the world is out of control. But God is still in control. There's nothing that happens in God's creation that he don't either make happen, he know that happened, or he calls to happen. God is the one who knows it all. All right, well, preacher, what are we going to do with this? You're almost out of time. This scripture shows us that we will never be able to fathom why God does what he does. And why things work the way they do. Why? Because God's mind is infinite. He doesn't have any boundaries or limits to his knowledge. Think about all the reason, understanding, and truth that we know today. And all the knowledge and learning that currently lies beyond the reach of our mind. God doesn't just already know all of that. He created it. Y'all see that? And God knows our every plan, idea, and intention. He knows the infinite number of futures that could possibly play out based on any number of decisions made by billions of people every day. You say, what, preacher? What are you trying to say? Well, I want you to understand that God knows what would have happened if you would have made a different choice. God already knows that. If you would have married this person instead of that person, God, God knows what would happen. If you'd have chosen this school or that school, this career or that career, to live in this city or that city, God already knows that. Remember now, and, 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 and that means that his expectation is not like ours. Because there's nothing we could do to let him down. Why? Because he already knows the bad decision you're going to make years before you make it. You can't surprise him, Brother Davis. You can't pull nothing over on God. You, you, you can't fake him out. You can't jab step and go to the left and Heisman trophy him off you and, and try to outrun God. God already knows. 
He already knows. So, so what do we do with this now? Now, the question is, so what if Moses would not have answered the burning bush? Or if David wouldn't have fought Goliath? Or Judas wouldn't have sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of soup? What if you would have dated someone else, gone to another school, been born in a different set of circumstances? God knows every outcome of every decision you could and ever will make. Thus, God doesn't have any expectation on you that you cannot fulfill. How can you let down someone who already knows what you're going to do? So he already knows what you're going to do. Therefore, you do not disappoint God. Now, that don't mean your actions don't displease him because he don't want you to do wrong. But you don't disappoint him because you cannot let God down. Why? Because he already knows your outcomes for you live them. All right, preacher, what are we going to do with this? Besides the fact that God knows everything, he knows everything about you like a computer game programmer. God knows every possible maneuver that you can make. That means potential thoughts and actions. Now, I got a quote for you. Y'all could use this. Uh, Troy, you want to use this? Uh, you can have this one for free. Every one of your disappointments is your appointment with God. Brother well, Page, you can have that one too. You did some preach right here. Every one of your disappointments is an appointment with God because it is in those times when you let yourself down and you let others down where you need to take, take and have a, have a residence with God, where you need to make an appointment and talk to God. All right, let's land this plane. The Bible teaches us in Psalm 139, beginning at verse number 13. David said, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. And skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they are all written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Long story short, before you got here, God already knew your start and your ending at the same time. He already knew it. And he created you and made you, and you belong to him. David shows us that there is nothing about his life that has escaped God's knowledge. Even before he was born, God knew every day of David's life, even before he was created. In other words, God was forming him entirely before he was even able to mess up for himself. However, the fact that God knows us shouldn't drive us away from God. In fact, like David, it should draw us closer to God. God is an expert in you. Let him love you and all your ratchetness. I'm sorry, wretchedness. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It's the reason why we focus on Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8. But God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So I want you to watch this. We struggle with our secrets. And like this woman at the well, we act like they don't exist. But I want you to understand that Satan uses that against us and that he wants you to clam up and feel guilty about your stuff and not be honest and open with God, your father. I don't know about you, but uh, if you're a parent and you have a child and your child is, is messing up, I don't know about, my father instilled it in me and now I'm doing it in my kids. I just want you to tell me the truth. Now, Isaiah, he's not here, so I'm not going to put him on blast. He, he did something messed up. And, you know, parents, you know, we, we already know the answers to the questions we're asking. The kids don't know that. And if they, if they realize that, they just tell the truth. But, but you ask your child a question, you already know the answer for the answer. It. So I already knew the answer. So I, I started, uh, Jen would call it lawyering up. I started uh, in my set of questions. And, and I knew the boy was lying. You know, he, he's, he's 10 years old. That's what we do, right? He's trying to get out of trouble. And so I just kept, I just kept saying, Ike, if you tell daddy the truth, I'm not going to be mad. I won't be mad. I want you to understand. I already know. Just tell me the truth. But he was so fearful of getting in trouble, Brother Barry, that he wouldn't give me the whole truth. 
he, he give me layers of truth. Kind of like the woman at the well. I have no husband. <laughs> Jesus told him, I know you ain't got no husband because the one you with ain't your husband. Uh, uh, just lay us. Just lay us. Uh, 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 uh. Right, come on now. Just tell daddy the truth. And, and he, was, he wanted to, but something kept holding him back. And see, what was holding him back was the fear that daddy was going to get him. But he didn't realize, I, I, I just didn't want to be lied to. Especially when I already know the truth. So if you just come clean, no punishment, no harm, no foul. We're going to talk about it. We'll figure out how to deal with it. But, but, but just tell daddy the truth. We are just like that with God. We'll, we'll get on our knees and we'll pray and we'll skirt the issue. Because the conversation is too difficult to admit to. We, we, we'll give layers of truth. We'll hide behind verbiage. God, you know my heart. Yeah, that's a problem. He does know your heart. So why don't you act like he does? And we will not come clean with God. And watch this. We will walk around with our stuff and then give this facade that we got it all figured out. But you don't bless the next person. You know why? Because the next person looked just like you. They've also put on makeup. And they also cover up their wounds and blemishes. And they also act like nothing's bothering them. When on the inside, they're hurting. Now, Alcoholics Anonymous teach us that the first step in dealing with your problem is admitting you got a problem. And many of us struggle with sin and shame and we will not admit it because we are in denial that God wants to hear us and if he does can help us. And that's a lie that we have believed from Satan because not only does God want to help you, he holds the key and the answer to your very problem. But the first step in getting help is you got to admit it. And if we can just get you on that step, then God can take your faith and he can bless you where you are in your mess to help you come through that. But you got to trust him. Now, we all believe that God is going to save our soul in the last day. Don't we believe that? We preach that. He's going to say, oh, God, he's going to raise me up and I'm going to be with him in glory. Now, we trust God to save us. The question is, do you trust him to keep you? Now, if I trust him with my soul, I trust him with my carno. If I trust him with my soul, I trust him with my marriage and children. If I trust him to make heaven my home one day, I can trust him with my hurts. So the question is, will you give God your secret? Now, I've already proved to you that you can't let him down. You can't disappoint him. But God wants you to bring him your stuff. You come by faith. It's hearing and believing the word of God. If you're here tonight, you don't join Jesus in the pardon of your sin. Confess your sin. Repent and confess your sin. We baptize you. Come up a new creature. We had a baptism at 11. God is still adding to the church daily. Those that are being saved. If you're here tonight and you're already a child of God and, um, This sermon was in your lane. It's in your lane. See, Brother Moore, if I come down front, then people going to know I'm hiding something. That's all right. So what? They hiding something too. You're just getting prayer for yours. That's all right. Or Brother Moore, if I, if I admit that I, I have issues, that I make myself vulnerable and I make myself look weak. But the thing is, is you don't survive on your own strength. It, it, God is the one you're leaning on, right? It's the power of God that's making this thing happen, right? Do you trust him to keep you? 
If you're here and you need prayer for whatever reason, we beg you to come right now. Brother Bear, together we stand. Now is that stake? I'm in your heart too. Saves on the chastening. Seek the way pilgrims trot. Christians are awake. Yes, Jesus is coming. Morning or night or many will meet there. Trumpets will bless sound. You, bless you, Michael, as All you come of the dead shall white to meet in the sky. Going where no one dies. Heaven was by.